Please remain standing for the reading from the Gospel. The first reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of law, justice, mercy, and faith. Those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And from Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he, was, when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that they had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave his debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told the master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you also not have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was hung angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brothers and his trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Thank I'm going to do something a, a little bit new for me today, and maybe it's new for you as well. Uh, the sermon is uh, once known as a story sermon. So it focuses on a single story in the hopes that story can serve as a kind of a prism that we can uh, look through to illuminate our our own lives. I, I don't know if it can do a better job of illuminating our lives than that parable that Jesus told. It was a pretty clear one, wasn't it? Today's sermon is part of a series that's entitled Storing Treasure in Heaven. And the series comes from Matthew 6.20, where Jesus tells us to do just that, to store our treasure in heaven and not on earth. The first sermon in the series was about hospitality. The next couple of weeks I talked about confession and then humility. And today's sermon is about something that we love to receive but find hard to share, at least at times. Uh, Mercy and grace. If you might flip the slide, please. Storing treasure in heaven, mercy and grace. 
Let's pray. Holy God, we pray to know and understand you more. Free us from distraction at this time and open us to your word. Give us hearts open both to conviction and to a willingness to change. Come and teach us, Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, Colonel uh, Herbert Kepler was the kind of man who was hard to like, uh, but rather easy to hate. Uh, during World War II, Kepler commanded the German forces that were occupying Rome. And uh, as part of his position, he spent much of his time uh, sowing evil. You know, for example, when the Germans first occupied Rome, they demanded a ransom, a multi-million dollar ransom, for the lives of Jewish Romans. And the Pope quickly raised their demand, offered it to them, and Kepler then refused it, and instead ordered his soldiers to herd all the Jewish men, women, and children they could find into cow cars for shipment to the concentration camps. And of course back then in those days it was a time the SS troops would torture or murder uh, anyone in Rome uh, who opposed that occupation. Uh, later, as the occupation of the resistance uh, grew, the resistance forces exploded a bomb in Rome that killed uh, 32 German soldiers. And Kepler figured that 10, 11, 10 Italian lives were worth one German life, so he rounded up 320 citizens at random, uh, bound them, and marched them through the streets of Rome and herded them into cattle cars where they were then shipped uh, to some caves and ordered out of the cars and then murdered with machine gun fire. They, they put them in the caves, they blew up the caves to seal them off uh, so their loved ones wouldn't be able to find the body and pay respect. For all of his brutality though, Kepler uh, had one man that he really wanted to capture and uh, take out of use. And that was a man who came to mastermind a network, an underground network that was kind of like our underground railroad, which saved people from slavery uh, back around the Civil War. Except this was an underground network that sought to save the lives of allied POWs and the Roman Jews who had escaped being herded up. And Kepler, though, could never uh, capture uh, this man. And it was especially uh, frustrating to him because he knew who the man was, but he couldn't ar arrest him. He even knew where he lived, but he couldn't arrest him. The, the man's name was Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty. Do we have any uh, ex-Catholics here? Monsignors are big deals in the Catholic Church. And O'Flaherty was from Ireland, but he was assigned to the Vatican, and he was a Vatican priest and lived within the territory of the Vatican, which is its own sovereign country. And as its own uh, sovereign country and as a center, center of Catholic faith, uh, it was a neutral uh, in the war. And Hitler, in turn, was reluctant to invade it or have his soldiers invade it for any purpose because the German Catholic Church was rather standing by as the Nazis took over Germany and then did their work. And Hitler did not want to offend the German Catholic Church and activate them 
into any type of opposition. So Kepler was ordered to keep his hands off of the Monsignor and to not go inside uh, the Vatican. So as long as O'Flaherty remained in the confines of the Vatican, Kepler couldn't touch him. But there was a problem with that, because Kepler was the head of this underground network. And sometimes he had to go outside of the Vatican and risk his life to save the lives of other people. And, and so it was one bright, uh, sunny morning. Kepler got word that O'Flaherty was cornered in the home of someone outside of the Vatican. And that the German forces had surrounded that home. And Kepler sent word back not to go inside and get O'Flaherty because he wanted to personally be present when he was killed or arrested. And meanwhile, O'Flaherty had seen what was happening and he had gone down into the uh, cellar uh, of the house. And he figured he was a doomed, doomed man, you know, a trapped rat. And he stayed down in the cellar, trying to be quiet, until he heard the Germans enter the house above him and tear the place apart. And then he heard the footsteps coming toward the cellar door, and he thought he was really a goner. And it was then he heard the sound. Well, it sounded like, he said, rocks rolling down over each other. Have you ever seen rocks come tumbling down over each other? And he walked over where the sound was coming from, and praise the Lord, he looked up and he saw some daylight, and what it was was the winter coal supply for that house coming down into the coal bin of that cellar. And what they would do, the coal people would drive up and uh, empty the coal through the courtyard or some trap door leading down to the cellar. And Kepler looked up and saw that, and he scrambled up that bin uh, over the tumbling coal and pushed open the door and there was a courtyard there. And there were two Italian coal men who were standing there. And on the other side down there he could see the German troops. And for some reason they pulled him out and he stripped his robe off and tore his shirt and wiped himself in coal dust and the three of those men uh, escaped past the German guards. <laughs> now, O'Flaherty, though, was not always a hero. As a matter of fact, he didn't do anything with the war, but remained neutral until 1943. And it was until the Germans came in, and until the day they started hurting the Roman Jews onto those trucks to be shipped to the concentration camps. And, and that turned him against him. And when he started building this network, it was in fact devoted to saving allied lives, American lives, and Jewish lives. And by the time the war ended, they had saved 7,000 people. And there's a monument that we have up here to uh, uh, Father O'Flaherty to die, if you could flip that one. Oops, didn't make it. It's a beautiful monument, a nice <laughs> statue. So until the war ended though, from that day in 1943 when they had O'Flaherty captured, there was this continuing cat and, and mouse game uh, between him and, and Kapler. But the war ended and he remained free and able to do his work. And it was really though the ending of the word of the war that led to O'Flaherty's most remarkable rescue. Kapler was arrested and tried and convicted of war crimes, you know, among other things, having those people slaughtered at the caves and you know, sending the Jews off to the prison camps. And, and it, 
Yeah, he was a, a, a man of murder and, and torture, and it's hard to comprehend or sympathize with or show Christian love toward a man who does things like that. It's not just me, is it? I mean, uh, you know, it's not just somebody you want to sympathize with. There was a slaughter of millions of Jewish citizens that he participated in, and, and it was an attempt to wipe the Jewish face off the earth, and there was also this massive face-to-face -face slaughter of civilians, and it's hard to fit evil like that in, into your minds. But you know, it's also comparatively easy for us to dislike or hate people who have done much less, isn't it? The bully at school, uh, a gossip at work, man who cheats with your wife, uh, uh, a woman who cheats with your husband, you know, the son-in-law who might uh, be abusing uh, your daughter, or just the jerk who cut you off in traffic five minutes ago. And you can feel this righteous hatred uh, toward people like that. And this righteous hatred is something that I think we feel when we think we're, we're right, and we know that person has done something wrong, and that wrong has been to us, or someone we love, or to society at, at large, to other people, you know, to innocents, as Jokar Sinaev, uh, for example. You know, we can hate for relatively small stuff, uh, much less big stuff. We get this sense of righteousness within them. And, and, I, and I guess that hatred is multiplied for people like Sernayev and, and Kampler. But that's what makes O'Flaherty uh, such a remarkable man. Because you see, only one person ever visited Kampler in prison. One person over the 20 years uh, he was there. You know who that was? It was uh, O'Flaherty. And he went there almost every month uh, until he died. O'Flaherty died in 1963. And he went there every month between the Nuremberg trials and 1963. And of course, he was on a different kind of rescue mission. You know, he wasn't uh, giving people uh, to safety through this underground network, but what he was devoted to was reaching out to this soul in, in need and showing him mercy and grace. You know, more than most of us, O'Flaherty had this courage to fight evil and to seek justice at, at tremendous risk during World War II, but then he also lived out this commandment to love our enemies and, and you remember that parable that uh, Sandy read out and show uh, forgiveness and uh, forgiving of trespasses as we have been uh, forgiven. Remember Peter came up and asked uh, Jesus, Lord when my brother wrongs me how often must I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus said no. Not seven times, I say, 70 times, seven times. You know, of course, we have to realize forgiveness isn't saying that something didn't happen. It did. Forgiveness is not saying that something is okay, because it's not. Forgiveness is not saying that we no longer feel hurt, because we darn well might. But for Father O'Flaherty, anyway, forgiveness was saying this, I, I feel the pain but I'm um, letting go of your involvement in my pain. It, it was this attitude of faith whereby he was able to turn over to God whenever punishment might be coming uh, to Kapler and instead be an instrument of God to spread mercy and grace and I tell you to spread mercy and grace Everyone needs it, and by golly, this world needs it as well. Uh, so he was able to turn this over to God and focus instead on how a soul might be helped. 
that's the same challenge that we often face, whether the offense is small or large. So Kapler heard from O'Flaherty that he was forgiven. And O'Flaherty let go of his need to do what we often do, which is judge, correct, rebuke, and ponder, if not seek, uh, revenge. And finally, after 10 years of monthly visits from O'Flaherty, Kepler, this former SS colonel, Nazi war criminal, sought salvation from God in the waters of baptism that had been poured by O'Flaherty. So through his forgiveness, O'Flaherty was able to pour this mercy and grace on Kapler and save his soul. And that's re remarkable because he was truly a man after God's own heart. And of course, we're not going to, may not do anything so dramatic, but, but the question arises for us this day and all days who might you show mercy and grace to today? Who in your life might you show mercy and grace to today? Hopefully for sure your loved ones. You know, hopefully your friends. Maybe a stranger. And maybe even the person you hate. It's always been hard for me. But here's the deal. God calls for mercy and grace uh, to each of them because he offers his mercy and grace to each of them as he offers it to us. And in this parable, uh, he tells us to do the same. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Lord, we pray that you fill that which is empty in us that you complete that which is incomplete. That you mold with care those parts of us that are poorly formed. Pour your mercy and grace in us that we might be made new and that we might be able to share that same mercy and grace with others. In the name of your loving Son, Jesus Christ, who came to save our souls, we do pray. Amen. Amen.